Good morning. I'm Brenda Talent, the CEO of the Show Me Institute. Thank you for joining us today as we discuss the 2024 blueprint for moving Missouri forward. We publish this document annually to identify key reforms that we believe will have the greatest impact in helping Missouri grow and Missourians prosper. As an independent research and education organization, the Show Me Institute focuses on Missouri fiscal and economic policies from a free market lens. We want Missouri to be a place that leads the nation in wealth, quality education, and a flourishing civil society. Much needs to be done to get us there, but we have a roadmap in our blueprint. Now, I'm going to get some housekeeping out of the way before we begin. Zach Lawhorn, the Communications Director for Show Me Opportunity, is going to be our moderator today. He'll introduce the speakers, and he'll take questions during this briefing. To ask a question, look at the bottom of your Zoom screen and you should click on the Q&A button. There you can type your question and Zach will identify when we have a question and read the question submitted. You can submit your question at any time. And with that, I'm gonna turn the program over to Zach. Thank you, Brenda. Um, all right, we've got a lot to get into, so we're just gonna jump right in. I wanna start with Susan Pennegrass, the Director of Education Policy at the Show Me Institute. Um, Susan, we're talking a lot about 2024 today, but before we do that, I actually wanna talk about 2023. Um, it was a big year in a lot of states, not named Missouri in 2023. Some have called it a record year for school choice. So can you kind of set the table for education reform in 2023, what that looks like and what Missouri did or did not do? Sure. So, you know, coming off of the pandemic and for a number of different reasons, momentum's been building around the idea of school choice for decades now. And Arizona took a big move about a year and a half ago. And the governor, the le legislature and the governor uh, passed a law that every family in the state could use their state funding to send their children to the public or private school of their choice. It was universal school choice. It was a really big move for Arizona. But just after that, West Virginia did it, then Utah did it. Then our neighbor, Iowa, the governor uh, in February signed a law that every Iowa family can take their $7,500 in uh, state funding to the public or private school of their choice. Again, universal choice in Iowa. Then the governor of Arkansas did it too, Sarah Sanders. And then Kansas uh, passed a law a couple years ago for open enrollment in, on the public school side. And it's the strongest public school open enrollment law in the nation now, and that's going to go into effect. So all around us, uh, that now nine states have universal choice. North Carolina has it as well, New Hampshire, Ohio, Indiana. So it's, you know, they're starting to fall like dominoes where parents have said, we uh, can't accept the idea of just being given one assigned school and that's our only choice. It doesn't work lots of times. And so, um, all around us, families are getting to choose any public or private school that they want. Oklahoma, I should mention too, families there who choose a private school can take a tax credit for the tuition that they pay, a uh, dollar for dollar tax credit that's refundable. So essentially, the state is covering private school tuition there too. So really exciting stuff. It was the year for school choice, 2023. Unfortunately, in the Missouri legislature, we were pressing and hoping for at least some even watered down version of public school open enrollment. We didn't get there. It got through the House and through the Senate committee, but not the Senate floor. So um, that was a big priority. It didn't happen. I don't know that it's going to happen again, but we are now sort of like this. Um, we're, you know, we're going to end up being the only state surrounded by states where parents get to choose their child's school instead of being assigned. Sure. So let's talk about a couple of the concrete actionable policy recommendations that you have in this year's blueprint. The first one, you can't manage what you don't measure. And so one of your items is school report cards, having a quality, easily understandable place for parents to go and figure out the quality of their school. So can you tell us a little bit about the idea of uh, this school report card idea? Yeah, so our Department of Elementary Secondary Education, or DESE, puts out school report cards. They have test scores, but they don't have any way for parents to sort of put those test scores in perspective. Um, there is an APR accrediting system, but yesterday, the State Board of Education for the last school year, uh, the one ending in 2023, decided to fully accredit 517 out of 523 districts again. So now 
parents have no way of knowing if their district's doing well or not because every district is again, fully accredited. So we don't have any way for parents to sort of gauge between schools. I know a lot of families probably use great schools or something outside of Missouri, but we believe strongly that it is the state board and the and DESE's responsibility to produce report cards that give parents usable, actionable information that could help them understand how their school is doing relative to the other schools around them. And we have put one together on mostschoolrankings.org. We've done our own school report cards, but it is really the state's responsibility, and we are going to press for that again. And there is isn't too much of an ask, right? There's a lot of states that you've pointed to over the years that do this really, really well, right? So the one that jumps out that I talk about a lot is Florida, and they started their letter grades on schools and districts in the 90s, so uh, 25 years ago. And basically, when they began to assign letter grades to school, and it and it came with a law that said a student cannot be forced to attend an F school for more than a year or a D school for more than two years. So it gave families a way out of these D and, D and F schools. What they have done over time is uh, more schools were moving from Ds to Cs and Cs to Bs and schools were improving because they felt the pressure. And so Florida has continued to raise the bar on what is an A or a B and still schools and districts are uh, incentivized to move uh, up the scale. And so Florida performance overall has gone up by having this highly accountable system of assigning grades to schools. And uh, the other item item that I want to cover with you before we move on is the statewide school choice. So you mentioned open enrollment, there's uh, charter schools, restrictions where they can be. What are some of the concrete actionable things that the legislature can do this year to uh, expand school choice statewide? Well, we have a relatively new uh, scholarship program, the Most Scholars Program. And what we've seen in the first year or two since it's been enacted is that it needs some fixes. Uh, one is like timing wise, it's kind of weird because students need their scholarships in August and a lot of donations. This program is funded through donations that individuals or corporations can take 100 percent tax credit. But people tend to make donations, charitable donations by the end of the year, like in the December time frames. The timing doesn't line up. And what we would really like to see, first of all, to fix that program is have the state fund the first 25 or $50 million of the program so that the first group of students isn't relying on like pre-funding scholarships. And I think it's a commitment to the idea of school choice that the state funded publicly. Also, it's restricted to children in our largest communities, 30,000 or more, or chartered count, chartered communities. And that's not fair. I mean, there's kids throughout the state that need these scholarships. So we would get rid of that 30,000 resident uh, restriction. And finally, the um, scholarship amounts are flat, the basic foundation amount. And even in the foundation formula that gets sent to districts, low-income students and students with disabilities get an added weight. They get an extra amount on top. And we would like to see that extra amount added to their scholarships as well. And, if and people that want to find be done this year. And if people want to find out more information on that program, they can go to the state treasurer's website, right? That's correct. All right. Uh, so staying in education, but moving on, Patrick Ishmael, Director of Government Accountability at the Shomi Institute. One of the items that we've had in the blueprint last year, it's in there again this year. You talk a lot about the idea of transparency, and with transparency comes accountability. One of the things that would increase accountability and transparency in education is a parent's bill of rights. So can you run us through the uh, key takeaways of your parent's bill of rights? Yeah, of course. So, you know, for the last six or seven years in particular, we've focused a lot on statewide transparency, but also local transparency. And initially we started with cities and counties and taxing districts. But since then, especially during and after COVID, uh, it became clear that there was a lot more interest in having transparency in schools and school districts. Uh, and I think, you know, when you have parents that are able to see the classes <laughs> as they're being taught live, I think it, it uh, pose a lot of questions uh, that, I, unfortunately, I don't think we're really answered all the time. So the idea of a Missouri Parents' Bill of Rights is uh, that parents have a right to know what their schools are teaching, uh, to know uh, how their schools are performing, to know how they're spending money, uh, and also uh, that they are, should also have the right to go to an existing educational option and send their kids to a school that, if under law, they're able to transfer schools, that schools or districts shouldn't be blocking them. And then lastly, uh, and especially in this period of uh, a lot of discussion about you know, transsexual you know, uh, transitioning issues, parents need to know exactly what's going on in their schools when it comes to their kids' health information and medical information. Uh, 
Uh, and what's been uh, heartening is that uh, it looks like you know, the legislature has allowed for pre-filing now. And so we can see some of the legislation that's coming forward. Uh, it appears that there is a Missouri Parent Bill of Rights that has been put forward uh, in the Senate. Uh, I, I'm optimistic about it. Unfortunately, one thing that we would love to see is that, like with the Show Me Checkbook, where you can see uh, spending online for school for uh, cities and counties and the like, we'd love to have all the curriculum that uh, is being taught also post online. That legislation doesn't have yet, uh, but I think that uh, if you're able to take money uh, from people and, and taxation is taking money from people through force, uh, you need to be held to a higher standard. And instead of requiring parents to ask, you know, pretty please, will you tell me what uh, my kids are learning? Uh, that sh stuff should be posted before the school uh, year even starts. So I'm hopeful that the Missouri Parents Bill of Rights is going to gain some traction this year. Certainly, we've talked about it quite a bit in the last couple of years. And there have been uh, a few uh, moments where we thought, oh, maybe it'll get done this year. But uh, hopefully, uh, the vehicles that we're seeing this year are going to be the ones that, that make it all the way. And one of the legal avenues that Missouri taxpayers, parents uh, have to find out some of that information is meant to be the the Sunshine Law. Um, you have a lot of experience with Missouri Sunshine Law. What are some of the concerns and areas in, of improvement you think that there are for the Sunshine Law? Yeah, I mean, the Sunshine Law is a great tool to kind of get uh, an in investigation or an ex exploration of how your government is working kind of started. But unfortunately, the Sunshine Law in Missouri, like a lot of states, is relatively weak. Uh, and, and what that means is that, uh, for example, when we uh, sent requests across the state asking school districts, you know, what are you, what are you teaching kids? There were, would be a lot of districts that would come back and, and more or less price us out of being able to get those documents. And what I mean by that is that we can ask for documents, but under the Sunshine Law, whatever government entity is responding to us, they can uh, basically charge us for the cost of producing those documents. And you would have rural school districts. We had three that were all next to one another that all came back with roughly the same amount uh, that would be charged to us if we wanted to see what they're teaching kids. And that amount was about $200,000 per, per school district. Uh, and basically what that means uh, in, in substance is that they're telling you uh, you're not going to see these records. And it's not just a rural problem. We had Lee Summit School District do something similar. They wanted $140,000 for their for their records. And it, you know, cities do this, counties do this. Uh, and, and so uh, the Sunshine Law is a great like starting point. But uh, un unfortunately, if you have uh, bureaucrats or elected officials that are motivated and don't want you to see something, the Sunshine Law in its current uh, state uh, can can kind of create the illusion of transparency while in substance denying it to you. If and, and if there's a violation of the Sunshine Law, taxpayers have a handful of options. One, they can, uh, if, if it's a high dollar figure, they can ask for it to be reduced or just pay it, or they can litigate it. And, and unfortunately, when you litigate these issues, there's no guarantee that you're going to be successful. And the consequences for the violating uh, department or district or city or, or county it is generally speaking very low. And so I, I think that there can be a lot of reforms to the Sunshine Law. I think the penalty provisions should be uh, 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 have some teeth in them rather than a like $5,000 penalty. It should be something quite a bit more significant than that if we want compliance. Um, but uh, certainly I would encourage uh, you know the public to leverage the Sunshine Law. But if you start running into problems with your, your state and local governments, uh, reach out to us. We might be able to help. Uh, but there, there certainly are some improvements that they need to be made. Sure. All right. Thank you, Patrick. I uh, want to bring in Avery Frank here. Avery, you have a new item for 2024 in the blueprint. I want to start with uh, the claim that Missouri has a teacher shortage. We've we heard this a lot last year, uh, a lot the year before, following the pandemic. Will you tell, is that a full truth, half truth? What What's the validity of the claim that Missouri has a teacher shortage? I think before you can answer that question, you got to look at the what are the enrollment trends and what are the hiring trends throughout the state of Missouri? So today we have about 30,000 less students than we had 10 years ago. And, you know, the thought that comes to my mind immediately is that, you know, the, the pandemic probably had a big part to play in that. And the answer to that is, you know, yes, it did have a big part. But it's important to know that prior to the pandemic, enrollment had decreased six years in a row. COVID-19 simply served as an accelerant for this decline. And additionally, if you look post-pandemic, 
So you have enrollment drop from about 879,000 to 859,000 in 2021. And in the year following, enrollment did bounce back up, it went up about 4,000 students. And, you know, with this rebound, people are thinking, oh, you know, enrollment's going to, it's going to climb back up. We're going to, the grades are going to get better. The enrollment's going to go back to normal. It's going to be okay. But recently, DESI released their 2023-2024 preliminary enrollment data, which is preliminary, which means it could go up and down a little bit. But nevertheless, that enrollment actually went back down again for 2024, back down 860,000. And all this goes to signal that maybe these students aren't coming back. You know, this enrollment drop might be here to stay. And I think that's important when you like when you're looking at this problem that on the other side of the coin, we have teacher hiring trends that the total number of teachers in our state has continuously and steadily risen for the past 10 years, as we have over 3000 more student teachers today than we did 10 years ago. So we have 3000 more teachers and 30,000 less students. And sure, if you this, could talk me, talk me a little bit about the uh, areas that those those teachers, the classes that they teach, are there shortages in specific areas or is it an across the board shortage? Yeah, I think districts are feeling the heat because as I said, they're not suffering from a general teacher shortage. They're suffering from shortages in specific subject areas, particularly in physics, special education, chemistry, English language learning. But these districts, they have their hands tied in actually solving that issue. You know, that these districts, Missouri uses a single salary schedule which only considers experience and whether or not a teacher has a master's degree. And with that in mind, a teacher cannot pay another teacher a higher salary, a bonus, or offer loan forgiveness in a specific subject area, even if that district desperately needs it or if they haven't had that position filled in many years. So your blueprint item, teacher pay differentiation, would allow these districts to pay teachers more for harder to fill positions, correct? Yes. And although, you know, teachers face some, do face similar challenges in the classroom, like the physics teacher, you got to teach about velocity and a lot of other harder subjects. And then the elementary teachers have to chase around a lot of kids and make sure they're actually listening. But the market alternatives for their respective skill sets are not equal. You know, we hear all the time that the teaching field is low paying. But if you look at and if you take that into consideration, you have if you have someone with a master's in physics, versus someone with a master's in English, the one with a master's in physics is going to have a lot higher paying job alternatives. And with that, they would be forfeiting more money to become a teacher. And as we call that in economics, you know, it's an opportunity cost. They have a higher opportunity cost. And this is barring a lot of individuals, you know, from joining the teacher field. And as if we could use pay differentiation, I think that could be a good strategy to help target that. All right, thank you. Uh, I want to move on to the budget. Elijah Pellis, the Director of State Budget and Fiscal Policy at the Show Me Institute. Last year, Missouri's big, biggest budget on record. Um, Elias, looking forward to 2024. Uh, are we going to break a new record? Uh, unfortunately, probably so, but I'm hoping that there's um, kind of some pushback to, um, you know, rein in this trend here because um, what we're looking at right now, uh, the most recent data is showing that state uh, tax collections are down about 3% on the year of uh, the federal government. So part of the reason that Missouri's uh, government's been growing so much is because there's been so much federal funding from uh, COVID, but there's also been um, you know, other state spending there. But the federal government is starting to wind back or draw down some of their um, spending that they've been giving to states, whether that's through you know the Medicaid program education, other places like that. So um, the state of Missouri has a pretty big question ahead of it of, you know, are we going to continue this trend or are we going to try to get the government back to even the size it was five years ago? We're looking at um, a state state spending that's over 40 percent higher than it was just five years ago, uh, basically a budget that's double what it was about a decade ago. And, um, you know, it doesn't doesn't take too much to realize that that's pretty unsustainable going forward, especially if revenues are going down. And so one of the themes already uh, in the program has been it's hard to find data in Missouri for some public expenses, public data. Um, when you're trying to find answers and numbers around the, the state budget, how difficult or easy is that process? Well, it's incredibly difficult. Um, 
even right now, the um, Missouri House Budget Committee is meeting, going through these, um, going through next year's budget requests. And what you see is um, it's very hard for Missourians to go figure out what the legislators are looking at. But even if you did find it, um, you're looking at just incredibly hard to read documents. I mean, the the budget this year for uh, DESE is over 1,200 pages. The budget for um, the Department of Social Services is almost 3,200 pages. And so you're looking at just spending this going up every single year. Um, Missouri uses what's called an incremental budgeting uh, process, which essentially means we start from last year's budget and go forward. So these books are only getting longer and longer. Um, it's harder to tell where this money's going. It's hard to know um, from these programs, you know, whether they're doing a good job or not. And, um, you know, there's just not a good place for Missourian to say, hey, you know, I, I want to see you know, how um, the state is spending on, you know, Medicaid. Where do I go to figure that out? Frankly, um, you know, as someone that's worked on the budget a lot, it, I mean, it would still take me even probably about 10 minutes to get to that point. And that, you know, is something that it's still not very easy to under, easily understandable. So Missouri needs to kind of increase this in, um, transparency, accountability um, type metrics where we basically say, okay, we're going to make it so that every Missourian can see where their money's going. And, um, you know, once they go try to see how much these um, programs are um, costing, they can sort of see how these programs are doing. There's not going to be so much hidden from uh, taxpayers because one of the other big issues that um, is new to this year's blueprint, because we've been, you know, kind of sounding the alarm bells on Missouri's, um, you know, growing spending for years now. But one of the things that we added this year is uh, kind of shining a light on the idea that, you know, while spending is going up a ton, there's also a ton of um, state taxpayer dollars that are being devoted to um, other um, entities, basically through economic development subsidies, um, tax credits that aren't even put in the budget. And now this is over um, $600 million per year. It could be more than that in the years to come. And that is not in the budget. You know, the, these are dollars that if the state would collect them, tax credits means these um, recipients aren't paying these taxes. If those, mo if those monies did come to the state, you know, those would be things that the state, um, you know, the House Budget Committee could put towards education. They could put towards roads. And so we're trying to kind of shine a light on that because really, um, you know, the, the difference between the level of services Missouri is getting and the taxes they're paying is growing. And, um, you know, we want to be prepared for the years to come that if, you know, we don't sort of right size this, you're going to be looking at um, a much bigger government that probably needs higher taxes. Yeah. And we'll talk about this more in depth in a little while with David Stokes, um, the, the subsidies, but uh, they even brought back some previously defunct tax credits. You wrote a lot about last session, the film tax credit, and now there's this new production tax credit in Chesterfield, right? So what, what do you think about uh, giving those another shot? Well, I think it's a horrible idea. Um, you know, we, we've seen before that this doesn't work. We have a lot of data showing that, you know, the return of the return on investment for these things is just frankly horrible. And I think part of the reason that they came back was that these, uh, the spending for, um, you know, these tax credits going towards, you know, different movies or this facility in Chesterfield, this isn't having, you know, this isn't balanced against other, um, other state spending priorities. You know, when the budget committee gets together, they have to put together a balanced budget. They have to say, hey, we think this much uh, is going to be raised from income taxes this year from Missourians, and we're only going to spend that. Well, when you're looking at giving money to, um, you know, this group in Chesterfield, other um, economic development opportunities, you basically take this money off the top, don't compare it to the uh, downsides. And I think, you know, that is a bit, it's a big problem for Missouri. And I think, um, you know, going forward, we're looking at just a lot of different spending, um, tough spending decisions, um, you know, whether that's the revenues going down, um, the federal money being uh, taken back that Missouri has been reliant on. And then even, you know, additionally, last year, the legislature passed a um, basically a welfare benefit cliffs bill that the fiscal note says is going to cost over $200 million per year if it's implemented. So we have a lot of costs on the horizon. And, you know, it's frankly just a raw, it's, it's a very bad fiscal idea to be, you know, when you have all these tough decisions out there to then be taking money off the top and giving it to, you know, uh, chosen, chosen winners te technically. Yeah, and the last thing before we move on from the budget, you mentioned uh, there's a lot of federal money sloshing around. There were some COVID bills, 
there was the infrastructure package. What's the the current state of that? Is there still money, federal money flowing in at higher than normal levels? I know there's been a lot of talk about expanding I-70 and there's a debate whether where that money is going to come from, if that's going to be infrastructure bill money or if it's going to come from general revenue. So what is that? Is that spigot still on or has that been turned off and now we, we wait to see what happens? Sure. So the, basically there's multiple spigots essentially. There, there's a lot, there's a lot of money coming to Missouri, but there's slowly being turned off. Some are, you know, already off, some are continuing. So um, for Medicaid, one of the biggest uh, sources of in, um, increased federal funding, that's every quarter, the, the um, amount of money the federal government government sending to Missouri is uh, getting getting lower. Um, when it comes to roads, I think some of that money's already been given to Missouri, but we haven't spent it yet. Um, in education, I think there's a little bit still that is um, yet to be yet to be spent, but is out there. And then um, one of the big questions for this next year is um, I think in just a couple months, we're gonna Missouri is going to be looking at um, there was enhanced enhanced funding for child care, the state's child care program, that the federal government was paying for much higher rates than uh, previously Missouri could afford. And the federal government's going to be pulling back that money altogether. So all that money is going to be gone. And Missouri has to, you know, make the decision of, you know, our state taxpayers going to continue paying those rates because it's very, very expensive. And, um, you know, that money is completely gone. And, you know, balancing this across everything, you know, we're looking at next year, a lot of these sources aren't going to be here at all. So um, I, there's some pretty tough decisions, and I'm I'm hopeful that next year we're not coming back here saying that uh, you know it, it was another bit it was another uh, record breaking budget, and we really have some problems that we need to uh, solve before there's some massive uh, service cuts. Sure. All right. Thank you, Elias. Aaron Headland, Chief Economist at the Show Me Institute. Another area that's uh, generally expensive and kind of vague, hard to really know what the number is going to be is healthcare. People go to the doctor, they don't know how much it's going to cost. One of your blueprint items is healthcare price transparency. So how is Missouri doing right now on that? And what can we do better in 2024? Yeah, yeah. hi, Zach. And this is a critical issue. I mean, it's a critical issue in Missouri, but also really across the country overall, because healthcare expenses have been going up very rapidly for many, many years right now. And we even hear at the federal level debates about, well, you know, Medicare is getting really expensive, Medicaid. And the debate oftentimes focuses on cuts or non-cuts or what kind of changes you make. But underlying everything in healthcare, whether it's insurance or these government programs or other aspects of it, is the fact that nobody knows what things cost ahead of time. So unlike in every other area of the economy where people can see what the prices are, see what the value is, and make a decision, in healthcare, you can't do that. And that's a problem, not just for the patients, it's also a problem for the doctors. They don't even really know what the thing has cost. So you're never going to get an efficient allocation of resources, which translates to healthy outcomes and intact pocketbooks without that. So under the previous White House, there was a, uh, an executive order issued to basically tell hospitals they need to make the prices that they charge available. And available and accessible in machine readable format, meaning that people could open it up in an Excel document and look at it transparently. And companies could create very consumer friendly websites for people to navigate. And in fact, that was mandated too. And uh, this is one of the things where the current White House continued it. So this is a bipartisan thing. Unfortunately, the latest analysis shows that only 36% of hospitals are actually compliant. And some of them are, even when they're trying to be compliant or pretending to be compliant, I should say, they're actively undermining access by putting things in a website code that make it difficult for search engines to actually pick up what they're posting. So really what we need to do is strengthen this. And there are a couple of ways that we can do that. Uh, one way we can do that is Missouri can enshrine the federal executive orders into state statute so that they have the power of law. They also have the option of even adding penalties on top of that. And another thing that Missouri can do, which some other states have pursued, is to say to hospitals that are non-compliant, if you're not going to comply with this, we are not going to allow you to enforce debt collections against patients who have medical debt. Yeah, and that was actually going to be my, my follow-up question. That's a really interesting idea to me. Can you kind of uh, unpack that a little bit more for us, the idea of not allowing hospitals to chase down medical debt? So currently, um, 
you can it, it goes into collections and it, but you're saying uh if the hospitals don't comply with these transparency regulations that they just you they can't collect that revenue exactly yeah part of the challenge with the initially very very low compliant compliance rates was that penalties just were not severe enough and when you think about particularly large medical providers who enjoy local monopoly power they thought to themselves well we'd rather just pay a fee and be able to maintain these opaque pricing patterns so that we don't have face competition well the marketplace is driven by competition that that's the things that generates growth and consumer welfare so there have been efforts to strength, you know, make those penalties harsher, um, but there's going to be some providers that no matter how high you make some of those penalties, they're still not going to comply. So this is yet another way to tell hospitals, you can't go after vulnerable patients who were not able to make a fair choice when they were getting their own care by pursuing them for debt that they're owed when you're not even living up to your obligations as a provider to make prices known to people. Is the gold standard for this still the Oklahoma Surgery Center? Is that something that an example that people look to and say they're doing this really well? Yeah, there's been advancement. That's that's a great example of, of advancement. Um, you know, there aren't there aren't any states that have anywhere near 100 percent compliance. So this is this is an issue that needs to be dealt with in a lot of places. And in Colorado, for example, has pursued this this kind of medical debt way of of doing things. Uh, but the point is, it's absolutely possible. This is not an issue where providers are technically un, like incapable of doing it. They want to do it and they just can't. This is a situation where for the most part, hospitals just haven't really done enough. Um, and then there are some things that can be done, you know, especially at the federal level to make some of the requirements even more clear to follow. But there's, there's a lot that we can do just on the enforcement side. All right. Thank you, Aaron. Staying with healthcare, bringing uh, Patrick Ishmael back in. One of your areas is free market healthcare policies. And during COVID, we were in an emergency. There were a lot of regulations, a lot of red tape that were, were torn down because we wanted to make sure that people in a, a lot of instances could get remote health care. Um, some, some, in your estimation, some positive things happened there. Um, did we put those walls back up? Is that red tape back up? What's the status of that? Yeah, you know, some of that, that red tape has gone back up, unfortunately. And But quickly to Aaron's point about, you know, markets uh, being driven by competition. I think that is absolutely true in the healthcare space, and maybe especially so. And and so I, I one of the, the sets of reforms that we saw uh, during COVID that was put into law was this idea of interstate license reciprocity. Uh, and I think that was a, a positive step to ensure that you know, regardless of where you were in the state, that uh, just wherever a, a doctor might have his license from, that was not an obstruction to you getting care from that that, uh, that doctor necessarily. Um, but I think that, you know, when you're looking at things like scope of practice, you know, certainly those walls have kind of gone back up uh, for a lot of nurses. Uh, there have been like uh, tinkering along the edges of what nurses can do since COVID, uh, whether we're talking about, you know, being able to uh, operate farther away from a doctor if they're a nurse practitioner, but in a lot of respects, scope of practice still needs to be reformed in this state. Uh, telemedicine still needs to actually have some laws put in the books to make sure that folks have access. But even outside of that, you know, we talk a lot about certificate of need reform. Uh, and really, when we're talking about certificate of need reform, we're really talking about repeal of certificate of need. And for those who are unfamiliar with it, certificate of need is this idea that a hospital has to go to the government and ask permission to open up or to maybe install some new services. And uh, whether you're talking about COVID times or whether you're talking about just regular times, uh, certificate of need is a, a, a bad uh, policy that has uh, certainly uh, gone past its due date. Uh, it's uh, been kind of on the books across the country, more or less for 40 or 50 years. Some states have moved away from it. Uh, but what you wanna do, and this goes back again to what Aaron was saying about competition in the market, if you increase the number of suppliers of a certain service, uh, generally speaking, that's going to bring prices down. Uh, and that is really kind of the whole idea of free market healthcare reforms, whether you're talking about reforming scope of practice so that folks can do more uh, that are professionals that know, uh, you know, can do things, but they're restricted by law from doing those things that they're trained to do, whether that means ensuring that people who are licensed are able to do what uh, work to the fullest extent of their license, telemedicine, uh, and of course, you know, as part of our blueprint item, we also talk about Medicaid reform. There's a lot of stuff that can be fixed there. 
but un unfortunately, there's uh, a lot of uh, uh, barriers to changes because of federal law. But we certainly have ideas that if we had the opportunity to reform Medicaid, uh, a handful of things that we might do to it. Sure. And before we move on, just touching a little bit more on the, the Medicaid piece, um, one of the things is just checking the roles, making sure the people who are on the program are eligible for the program, right? So what can you tell us about that process? Yeah. So during COVID, there was basically a, a limitation imposed on states uh, that basically said that if someone has enrolled in Medicaid uh, during this period of time, that you cannot basically clean your roles. And what that means is that if, for instance, you had somebody who qualified for Medicaid, but maybe they started making too much money and then didn't qualify for it anymore, you couldn't really remove them, which meant that the uh, Medicaid roles in Missouri ballooned to uh, uh, historic levels. Now, at this point, we're starting to see a little bit of cleanup of those roles, which means that uh, we are going to see some savings in the state budget uh, on Medicaid. But at the same time, you know, getting the Medicaid program back to roughly what it should be, even if we were able to do that, and hopefully we will see that that happen, that's not enough. It's not just about making sure that the people who are qualified the program are, uh, are, are the only ones in it. It's actually making the program better. And what we've seen in research across the country is that unfortunately, Medicaid is a poor way of delivering health care to the neediest among us. So it's not just about uh, fixing the, the number of people who are on the program, which we need to do, and I think the state is in, in the process of doing, but it's actually making the system more responsive, providing more options to beneficiaries and ensuring that instead of being a program that seems to serve government first, that's actually serving the neediest first instead. All right. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, David Stokes, Director of Municipal Policy at the Show Me Institute. We're going to talk about two items you have in this year's blueprint. I want to start with one that Elias actually touched on earlier, and it is those subsidies, the economic development subsidies, giving money to developers. So can you give us a rundown of the problem? And then uh, how can we make it better this year? Well, I hope this is the year where we start making it better. For for the prior decade, Missouri had at least gotten to the point where we weren't making it worse. And there were some small improvements along the way. Last year, that sort of changed. And at the state level, we did make it worse with some some terrible economic development packages. And also we've seen, you know, at the local level, it's a consistent, you know, one step forward, but now two steps back. The economic development subsidies are, are out of control in Missouri. In 2021, Kansas City approved $8.2 billion in, in eventual subsidies for one development project north of, north of Kansas City. That's billion with a, with a B, I, I didn't misspeak. It's, it's just astonishing. And here we have the Kansas City Royals seemingly lining up various cities and counties to see who's going to offer them the largest subsidy package in the very near future to see where they'll locate their, their new stadium. Now, interestingly enough, just today, a group of economists in Oklahoma released a letter about the, the harms of economic and the negative effects and the total uselessness of economic development subsidies for sports stadiums related to one in Oklahoma City. And all those same arguments would of course apply in Kansas City. One of the things, one of the things we're making small improvements on here is that, and something that we really have been pushing at Show Me Institute for a long time, is we really wanna see more of the tax increment financing or TIF decisions made at the county level. Uh, in most of Missouri, they're made at the city level. And that leads to a lot of of terrible decisions because uh, TIF's bad top to bottom, uh, but at least if you're at the county level, the county officials who appoint members of that commission are responsible for all the people affected by the subsidy decisions. And cities, for example, within a city, for example, you'll pass a TIF that has a major impact on the school district. And oftentimes the people, most of the people who live in that school district don't live in that city. So they have no way of expressing their anger at the ballot box. You address that if you make these TIF decisions at the county level. Right now we have county TIF commissions in St. Louis County, St. Charles County, Jefferson, Clay, and Cass. Uh, they're fairly new in Clay and Cass, so we'll yet to be seen exactly what the effects are gonna be long run. But we know that in St. Charles and Jefferson County, it has dramatically reduced, essentially eliminated, the use of tax incre increment financing in those two counties. And in St. Louis County, it's had a positive effect. It certainly hasn't eliminated it, 
Uh, they approved, the county TIF commission approved a, a terrible TIF for Chesterfield uh, just early, late last year, but it has overall made the situation better. So if there's one change we'd like to see, it's to add a few more, dozen more of our larger counties to that county TIF commission list. Some other changes we call for in the blueprint include allowing school districts to opt out of tax increment financing. State law allows fire districts and ambulance districts to do that. And I see no reason why school districts shouldn't have that exact same right to opt out and continue to uh, apply their taxes to the area in the TIF. This is precisely the reason, uh, among others, one of the reasons why these school district rates are remaining, remaining high, because when you pass TIFs and subsidies elsewhere, it is higher taxes on everybody who's not in the subsidized area. Two other things we support. Two other things we support very quickly are, are requiring when new TDDs or CIDs, that's community improvement districts and transportation development districts, when they're approved in an actual public vote, uh, go forward instead of allowing property owner signature or other sort of ways to get around the spirit of the Hancock Amendment. I want to remind viewers they can submit their questions using the Q&A box at the bottom. And uh, briefly, David, before we move on to your second item, I've heard you say before, and I think this is a good point, that if these subsidies worked for development, St. Louis and Kansas City would look very different, wouldn't they? They would. They, they'd both be like, you know, Kuwait, just sort of a, a, wash, in, a wash in riches. Uh, they don't work. Economic development by subsidies doesn't work at all. The, the well-known East-West Gateway Council of Government study of TIF in the St. Louis region a decade ago, demonstrated that conclusively at the local level. They do not grow the economy. They do not grow jobs. They do not benefit at all. We want low, low across the board taxes for everyone, not special deals for some. Many times the people getting those special deals, shockingly enough, are politically connected and, and politically influential at the same time. All right, and the second item that you have that we're gonna talk about today is property tax reform. It's that time of year, people getting their property tax bills. Um, what are some suggestions you have going into 2024 uh, that might make some people who have sticker shock right now feel a little bit better? I think there's sticker shock all around the state of Missouri right now due to the combination of really high assessed valuation increases and high inflation, which allowed taxing bodies to roll their rates back less than usual. That result is the high tax increases that many, many people are seeing uh, for their homes and, and businesses all around the state. And absolutely, I think sticker shock is, is the right term for the letters people have gotten in the mail within the past three to four weeks. It's, you know, we're, there's things to do to move us in the right direction. And we unfortunately are doing something that's moving us in the wrong direction. I'll get to, I'll get to that in a moment. But if there's one really dramatic change, one very specific change we need to make, it's to remove the constitutional provision allowing the primary Kansas City School District, Kansas City 33, to be exempt from those tax rollback requirements. So the Kansas City 33 School District saw, I believe, according to the STAR, it was a 31% assessed valuation increase this year, and yet they didn't roll their tax rates back at all, not in the slightest. So that is the extreme sticker shock that homeowners within that part of Kansas City are seeing. This continues the trend. They've had enormous assessment increases the past two cycles uh, without rolling rates back at all. And this, this is truly taxing some people, particularly some elderly people, out of, out of their homes. So the, it's Article 10, Section 11G of the state constitution, which exempts them from rolling back tax rates as assessments increase. And that is uh, one part of our constitution that I think we absolutely have to repeal and somebody needs to put on the ballot to repeal it. There might have been a time for that argument a couple decades ago as the desegregation cases, which were its impetus, were winding down. Uh, that time is, is long gone now. Uh, around the state, voters and citizens need to do a better, need to be actively forcing, forcing for lack of a better word, their local elected officials, school district, fire district, cities and counties, to do a better job of rolling back rates, more so than they're legally required. That's what we saw this year with the high inflation. It saw, it, we saw it some places, Lee Summit School District rolled their tax rate back dramatically, even though beyond what they were legally required to, 
to offset the dramatic assessment increases that they experienced in Lee's summit. But more commonly, it was what happened in Melville, where yes, voters approved Melville's a school district in South St. Louis County, and voters approved the tax increase there in April, but then they saw a substantial tax assessment, an assessment increase later that year, and the school board did not adjust their tax rate at all. They continued with the near maximum voter approved increase on top of the dramatic assessment increase, leading to about a five, $6 million windfall for Melville School District on the backs of taxpayers. So it's time that voters and citizens really start demanding the local officials do a better job of rolling rates back. And then finally, it's the one thing that counties are doing, which is moving in the complete wrong direction, is giving these property tax freezes to senior citizens around the state of Missouri. So far, I would guess about a dozen counties have passed this, uh, so many more likely to do so in the near future. Giving one set of the population a property tax freeze might be good for them, but it's certainly going to lead to substantial tax increases down the line for everybody else. There are numerous problems that are going to come because economically from this type of poor policy. And while you may understand the politics behind giving senior citizens a property tax freeze, it makes for really poor public policy. And I hope the legislature uh, amends it substantially in the coming session. Taxpayers should have a bill of rights. And Elias, you, you've written one. Um, so I'm going to go to Aaron in a minute, but first I want to start with you. Uh, Taxpayer Bill of Rights, um, it's to keep a check on taxes in Missouri. We have something called the Hancock Amendment. So briefly to set the table, can you just give us a, a 30,000 level view of the Hancock Amendment and why you think we need to go a step further? Sure. So I, I think David just mentioned the Hancock Amendment a few times, and really a lot of the topics that have been discussed today sort of touch around the Hancock Amendment, whether people realize it or not. So um, a little over 40 years ago, Missouri essentially passed some taxpayer protections, basically saying, you know, if the government is going to grow too fast, um, you know, we want basically a refund. Um, and uh, voters should have to be approving um, tax increases. And, uh, you know, if our property taxes go up too much, uh, the rate should be rolled back. I mean, those are sort of the central kind of tenets of that. But what we've seen in the last uh, few years or so, there's a lot of holes in the amendment, partially from being too old, but also, you know, just our different governmental bodies have kind of found uh, ways around them. So, um, you know, the first piece relating to uh, refunds, um, a couple of years ago, state revenues were super high. The legislature considered giving back refunds. Well, if the Hancock Amendment worked, um, Missourians would have received a refund then. And, you know, if it was 1980, we would have, you know, if we saw that level of um, revenue increase. But essentially what happened was the way that um, that uh, the amendment basically um, defined how we would um, calculate these refunds, essentially decided that uh, it eventually it basically went out of date. And so now it's not going to work. Um, Missouri's over um, $3.7 billion below what the limit is. And so we're essentially never going to hit that. So refunds are sort of off the table. And the next one was there was essentially in 1996, voters approved um, an amendment to the Hancock Amendment that basically said if the legislature wants to raise taxes, uh, voters need to approve it. Now, local governments deal with that. As David mentioned, um, special taxing districts have sort of found ways around that. Um, and now Missouri's legislature has found a way around it. The um, gas tax increase that was passed in 2021. Um, you know, Missouri vote or Missourians have essentially realized that um, they didn't they didn't pass this gas tax increase. It's going up every year. And um, part of that is because the way the amendment um, essentially said how it would uh, determine compliance with it. The legislature essentially figured out that that wasn't going to work. Um, and then the last piece was uh, in recent years, as David also sort of touched on, um, you know, people got high, much higher personal property tax bills where they realize um, that local governments don't actually have to roll back rates like they do when the valuation of your home goes up. And so th there's all these different pieces of the Hancock Amendment. Um, and to not even put on, to add to that, there's even the piece of uh, tax credits that I mentioned before. So there's all these, um, there's a loophole in the, in the Hancock Amendment that essentially allows for uh, the tax credits to be out of the budgeting process, which I mentioned before. So there's essentially, 
um, major holes in this. And as more and more governments uh, we're seeing are kind of finding ways around it, and as we're discussing how government is um, growing and is looking like it's going to grow more, um, taxpayers need some level of protection here because really there's the this growth is unsustainable. And I think uh, the last time voters were given a chance, they said they want a say in um, whether their taxes are going to be going up, if their government's going to be growing. And ultimately, we decided um, that just fixing the Hancock Amendment, there's just too many issues that we really need to focus on something better, more something more like a taxpayer bill of rights. And Aaron, what are some of the recommendations or some of the ways that the taxpayer bill of rights would address some of the issues that Elias just outlined? Yeah, so this is a, a critical issue and the solution is actually quite simple. The solution is to say, we need to enact a speed limit on the size of government. So, and in particular, that speed limit should be the rate of inflation plus population growth. So what that means is that revenues would not be allowed to grow faster than that at all without explicit voter approval. And if revenues did come in faster than that, then there would be automatic tax cuts sent to the voters. So it wouldn't require any legislative action. There'd be no way to kind of wiggle around it. That's what would happen. Uh, and this is not a some sort of fanciful idea. This is actually something that Colorado has had in it, in fact, for quite some time. And uh, there are ways to even strengthen it relative to Colorado, but that's been very effective there in keeping their government from growing too rapidly. And in fact, actually, just a, just a month ago, uh, there was an effort to try to undermine that a bit, and that was defeated. So it's something that enjoys broad-based support in Colorado. And the reason is they've seen it work, right? They have seen actual refunds arrive in their pockets because of this protection that's in, fact, in effect. So that's the, the, the biggest pillar is the speed limit on the size of government, the, the requirement of voter approval to go above and beyond that. It has to be comprehensive. You can't poke holes in it and have kind of a Swiss cheese tax base to it. Um, and it, it also could be paired with some enhancements to a, kind of a recession preparedness fund. And also when it comes to the property taxes, uh, you also need to have rollback provisions on not just real estate property taxes, but also personal property taxation and commercial surtaxes so that, again, the tax the tax burden cannot go up faster than inflation. All right. Thank you, Aaron. Um, well, I do want to close out today with one question on kind of a newsy item to uh, Susan Pendergrass. Uh, Margie Van Dieven, the uh, Missouri Education Commissioner, said that she's leaving this summer. And we thought, well, there's going to be a long, drawn-out search, and we're done. Um, so there was a new education commissioner named yesterday. Susan, what's your uh, your first reaction to the choice? I mean, my first reaction is kind of what you just did, which was like, wow, that was so fast because the current commissioner is not leaving her post until June. So we have about six months to, uh, could, we could have the state board of education is responsible for selecting this person. They could have certainly um, done it very publicly and transparently. They could have asked for, they could have posted the job. They could have taken in resumes. They could have looked outside the typical area. Um, right now, Desi's under a lot of heat. Our test scores are going down. As Avery mentioned, our enrollment is going down. Our college readiness numbers are going down. We had the lowest average ACT scores last year since the year 2000. You know, we have a lot of really big headwinds and the federal money is going to be cut off this year. So the person coming in is coming into a, a department with a ton of challenges. It's a $10 billion budget, $10 billion budget and 1,500 employees. So it's a really big, really important job. And it seems from the outside, because as the public, we don't have any good information here, as though they simply tapped somebody. So they picked somebody who is a current state senator, Carla Esslinger, and a former assistant commissioner at DESE. And then she was superintendent of a couple of small rural um, districts in the middle of the state, but quite some time ago. That's all to be said that maybe she'll be fantastic. We have no way of knowing one way or another, but it is a very big job that requires really strong leadership, really strong management skills. And quite frankly, the ideal candidate would stand up to the board of education to say, look, you can't accredit every school district in the state when test scores have been down consistently, when we're struggling with chronic absenteeism and you simply fully accredit every district in the state, we really need a leader who is willing to say to the board that, that that's not a, an okay thing to do basically. But it 
seems from the outside as though perhaps they've chosen somebody who will be, you know, easier for the board to work with. I don't know that for a fact, but it seems like they pick somebody who is a known quantity within the state public education so, you know, establishment and perhaps will be easier for the board to work with. And what we need is like a, a change agent. And I, uh, unfortunately, I, I don't have any idea of this, if the new commissioner will be that or not, but I do know that the process was not very transparent or open. It seemed to not take advantage of the time that was available. And it seems that um, I, I don't even really understand why they announced it in December. She's going to continue to serve as a senator, which is just going to raise questions about whether she should be voting on bills that affect DESE's operation or their budget. And the board just could have avoided all of this by taking their time and being more public about their decision. Sure. Like you said, now it kind of seems like a hurry up and wait situation. Sure. I mean, I I suspect that I I really have no way of knowing, but um, I think that it would give the public more confidence if they had said, even if you think about like when you consider a chief of police or fire chief, they'll say, here's our top three candidates, superintendents, it happens all the time. Well, you know, these three people, even if there's one that they, they already want, but there was none of that. It was just all of a sudden like a chosen and it, it was done. It was just done and over with. And it was announced by the board yesterday, which it just seems odd to me. I don't think there's any smoking gun. It just seems like kind of mismanagement of the process. All right. Well, thank you all very much. Very informative. The uh, 2024 Missouri Blueprint, Moving Missouri Forward, up now at showmeinstitute.org. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Brenda. Thank you, Zach. I want to thank our team for putting together a great blueprint. I want to thank all of you who've joined us today. We wish you a wonderful holiday season. And be sure to visit us at showmeinstitute.org and read all the details in the blueprint. Thanks again.